Welcome everyone. My name is Radonica Coleman and I will be your host today along with your co with my co-host Dan Rice who is a Route 66 expert and historian. On behalf of NTT Data, I want to welcome everyone to the final stop on our digital transformation journey along Route 66, the beautiful Santa Monica Pier. If you have joined us for past events, you will know that we are sharing insight from digital transformation experts who are driving our businesses toward a better future. As we have driven along the famous Route 66 highway, which was integral to American road innovation, we have met some truly diverse characters who helped pave the road. If you have missed our last stop in California, where we talked about digital experiences, we have a quick recap video to show you. How did IndyCar go about taking this digital transformation journey? We're just scratching the surface and NTT is the perfect partner to help our, us develop our vision, think about it in terms of the fan, but the future is incredibly exciting and the biggest beneficiaries for our sport are going to be our fans. For us, a lot of where we're, we have been focused and working really closely with NTT is how do we take uh, what is happening in the race and almost put it in the fans hands so that they can feel uh, really close to the action. Whether you're French, Spanish, Japanese, it doesn't matter. They can contextualize the experience specifically for what it is the customer wants and needs. And I think that's true for so many other businesses. I break the bias by encouraging more and more women to get into and stay in STEM-related roles and sports. I have broken and continued to break the bias by being one of the only women in the room by leading some of the world's largest sporting events, including the Super Bowl, Olympic sports broadcast production, and the Indianapolis 500, the largest single-day sporting event in the world. At NTT Data, we want to commemorate Women's History Month by giving a donation to one of my favorite causes, Girls Who Code. So Girls Who Code is on a mission to close the gender gap in entry-level tech jobs by 2030. Here we are, we're uh, arriving finally in California, Route 66, 318 miles of some of the most diverse stretches of Route 66 that there are. And uh, as soon as you enter into, into California, you're gonna find yourself out in the high desert. And one of the other big surprises for people on Route 66 is they actually get to see a volcano not too far out of Amboy. That's known as the Amboy Crater. Uh, and they can see it right there in Amboy at Roy's Cafe. Further down the road uh, is Calico Ghost now this uh, was actually bought at one point uh, by the same guy that started Knott's Berry Farm. And, they, and you can stop there today. They never finish those plans, but you can stop there today and, and enjoy a walk through an, an old Western town. Wow, that high desert is gorgeous as we got to see. And I love the NTT data takes time to celebrate the past as we drive toward the future. So today, as we celebrate Earth Day, we have a power pack group focused on security and sustainability. So we will kick off our session with Shushila Nier, NTT's, NTT Data's VP of Security, who will moderate a security discussion, making your zero trust journey real to, to sustain success. Jim Revis, Cloud Security Alliance co-founder and CEO, Steve Williams, NTT Data's Chief Information Security Office, Chairman and Founder, and Jamika Green Aaron, Chief Information Security Officer at Off Zero, a product unit within Okta, will join her for this discussion. And then we'll wrap up with Dan Rice, who will take us down the rest of the California portion of Route 66 that ends right at his shop on the Santa Monica Pier. So now I would like you all to meet Sushila Nier. Thank you so much. And welcome to my wonderful panelists, uh, Jim, Steve, Jamika. Um, thank you for your partnership and expertise for this discussion. As you know, uh, today is Earth Day in which we are focusing on sustainability, which is so important as we think about security because it's foundational to organizations as they work towards sustaining the trust of customers and clients. 
We're going to discuss the um, the importance of securing and sustaining operations using a zero trust framework. And um, this is a wonderful example on your screen of really how NIST and CISA call out um, zero trust, the foundations of zero trust, these five pillars of identity, device, network, application, and data. And underlying those five pillars, visibility and analytics, automation and orchestration, and governance. Further, NIST calls out seven tenants of zero trust, and we're just going to bring those up to remind ourselves of what those tenants are. And as part of our discussion, we're going to be talking about how we take these tenants and infuse them into those pillars to enable us to take a zero trust approach to our architecture. So let me first of all start with a question for all of my uh, uh, panelists and maybe we could start with you uh, Steve. So Zero Trust was called out as a guiding framework in this year's US executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity and it's interesting because Zero Trust has been around for quite a while. Why has Zero Trust started to be really highlighted and is regarded as increasingly relevant, especially as we start to understand that cybersecurity is the fifth domain. It's our greatest strength technology, and it's also our Achilles heel. So your thoughts, Steve, on uh, why was it called out um, as part of the executive order? So I think President Biden really leaned into this one for two reasons, the first of which is an acknowledgement that this is not solvable by just the public sector or private sector alone. This really is going to be a requirement for both of, uh, both of those groups to really get together, put the best and the brightest uh, minds at work on this particular problem and think about how do we want to approach productivity in an increasingly remote world. Add on top of that then the pandemic and it was kind of a natural spark or catalyst to really push some of these agendas forward where you start having disparate workers with different devices and a lot of kind of the traditional castle and moat security paradigms really fell down. And something like Zero Trust, where you're starting to put more of an emphasis on identity and the user and really push the border away from, am I in my brick and mortar, just makes a lot of sense. Add on top of that, the view that, of course, across just the US government, but any government around the world has had very distinct views of how each department would do their security program. And Zero Trust really kind of says, look, there's, there's not a way to go do this. The approach is just fundamentally different. So I very much appreciate President Biden's view of we need to rethink this and we need more harmony between public and private sector uh, to, to move forward. Thanks, Steve. And maybe that kind of leads well over to you, Jim, because as a nonprofit, the Cloud Security Alliance has really been doing some wonderful work um, I think within Zero Trust and trying to get us to all understand Zero Trust, could you perhaps call out why you've taken that approach and how that aligns with the US executive order um, around Zero Trust? Yeah, happy to do that. So I, I think it's, it's very important that as we put a stake in the a ground about what Zero Trust is and we want it, what we want it to mean and how we get it implemented, it's really important to understand how dynamic uh, technology is and how we're going to see lots of new endpoint devices. We're going to see so many changes. And so it's really important that we take a technology agnostic and vendor neutral approach to defining the problem, understanding that, and then having this ecosystem approach where we can educate the individuals, create professional credentials, where we can create tools for organizations and even auditors to assess zero trust compliance. And so there's there's a lot that needs to be done. And we need to be thinking not just today and tomorrow, we need to be thinking a lot about the future as well. So we're not defining all of this at Cloud Security Alliance, we, we will do what we need to do. But there's a lot of great resources out there. And it's already been mentioned, great work NIST and CISA are doing. And I think you'll see a lot more in standards bodies. But we are really focused on that ecosystem of the individual professionals, the auditors, the organizations, the certification bodies, the, the entrepreneurs, the technologists, and bringing that all together. So we have something that is good today, but it's sustainable for the future. That's wonderful. So really harnessing the knowledge that's out there through maybe your working groups, Jim, would that be right to 
um, gain a, a common understanding. That's wonderful. Jamika, I, I did she was called out by both uh, Steve and Jim in, in, you know, in it being uh, pivotal within Zero Trust. Your thoughts around the US executive order and um, zero trust, and why was zero trust especially highlighted? I know there's some really interesting work going on at Okta around this area. Yeah, so I think to echo both what Steve and Jim said, I, I believe wholeheartedly in both of what they said, but I think there's another pillar and it's this idea of collaboration and action amongst the, the security community and amongst the CISO community. I think the executive order is starting to pave the way for us to be more collaborative. Essentially, our adversaries are almost always the same. Um, yes, we, we each have a competitive advantage within our business, but when we think about as CISOs, the adversaries that we're all fighting, they are the same adversaries. And so why are we doing this in such a disparate method? And I think what Zero Trust does is it paves the way for collective collaboration. Um, I think one of the things that's critically important um, for CISOs is to have access to knowledge around threat vectors, around vulnerabilities, around attacks, but not just access to the knowledge, the ability to share when we've actually been vulnerable. Um, and so I think that that's the final pillar that Zero Trust will really allow us this truly safe space where we can actually sit down and have conversations and share knowledge and share what our teams are done doing um, to successfully protect our enterprises. And I think Zero Trust is one of the first steps that will really allow us to segue into that collective collaboration. I love that. And actually, I think that um, I love the work you and the CISO community at Entity Data have been doing, Steve, with really coming out and talking about our own journey uh, towards um, Zero Trust. And, you know, just, and, and just, you know, out of interest for our audience, how do you manage to kind of talk to the board and go, you know what, this is, and you did this well before the pandemic too, is how do you have a board level discussion, right, about, about zero trust and why the board should invest in this, in this framework? A great question. I think boards, I think inarguably, boards and insurance companies and most of your external influence sources, if you will, have become much more attuned to broad-based risk and cybersecurity risk being probably the newest one that's on their radar. And a lot more conversations are happening. And at this point, they're still in the seek information, right? This is a lot like the, the early days of educating anybody on a new topic. They're not exactly sure what's going on or how to go do it uh, and, and what's right. What is everybody else doing? It's that kind of comparison analysis. And I think that's actually really powerful to talk to the board with a basis of zero trust because you, you're inherently inviting them to the idea that users are now part of this paradigm. And, and if you think of the classic way most technologists approach security challenges in the three-legged stool of people, process, and technology, we spend an awful lot of time on technology. And yeah, maybe, maybe little people and a little process, but it's almost like salt and pepper and it's not the main dish. And the reality is zero trust fundamentally changes that paradigm. It needs to take the approach of, you're not buying zero trust from an appliance. There's no solution out there that will just turnkey give you zero trust. You need to have your people and you need to rethink your processes. And that's really where the board is interested most in terms of what do we fundamentally need to invest in or change or have a cultural view that's different than what we used to do. And so when we were talking to the board about it, it's exactly what we started the journey with is this is all about user experience. I call this kind of the architectural paradigm or, or the university lawn paradigm. If you go out on a college campus and you're up on a high enough building and you look across the gorgeous landscape and there's invariably a sidewalk that leads from one building and out over to some other place. Yet across the grass, there's the natural footpath of your users that have walked someplace that the architects didn't have in mind. And that really is the story of Zero Trust in my mind, where our jobs as security professionals is to move our security to where people naturally want to go and naturally are, rather than create some awesome footpath, or in our case, technology, and try to force people to walk on something that's just not natural. Zero Trust invites that very big paradigm shift, and I think the board really gets that, and it resonates very well with them. That's wonderful, Steve. I, I love that description. And um, maybe pivoting over to you, Jamaica, I mean, 
What are you seeing in terms of, because you are a technology vendor, right? What have you had to do to be able to um, explain, I guess, how organizations can complement technology with people and process and collaboration to be able to zero trustify some of these uh, pillars? So I've done a lot of reading around this because I will tell you, um, our users and our customers can circumvent any technology that we put in place. Mm -hmm. I think when we think about what is effective, phishing is still the most effective delivery vector. Um, and that that is because of people. Um, and so I think when we think about that and we add technology to make um, to make the processes frictionless for the users, we and, and friction is a big word right now. And I think there's a reason for that. It ties to a Bunch of different strategies. One that came out for Gart from Gartner recently was around this concept of beyond awareness. And it's essentially, it's essentially a fancy word for saying that, hey, your users will unravel you very quickly. So what are you going to do to take that next step to go beyond um, awareness, culture, and education? And so I think for us, what we're starting to do is really understand how automation can assist us, um, how we can develop a product that learns users' behavior. So, I mean, outside of MFA, which we all know we should have, um, we, we're looking at strategies around adaptive authentication that really look at the user's behaviors that give the users a signature and then the, the technology adapts based on where the users are if they've moved if they're traveling i think the other thing that we're doing we're really focused on a new uh, product that we have called credential guard and i don't like it because it's our product i like it because it's it's leveraging automation to increase observability for CISOs. and essentially what this product does is it looks at credential stuffing attacks um, gathers data around those attacks and says hey your users were compromised in another space or with another vendor. And we're actually going to take action to reset passwords and to notify those users. So it's another step beyond us just detecting that there's something wrong. We're actually trying to take the data that we're getting and do something about it. And that essentially allows the users to also be involved because users are notified that their credentials have been compromised in various mediums and they can take an action to go and do something about it. So it's a reduction of friction in that they don't actually have to do anything to get notified. You don't either. We're really working behind the scenes to leverage automation to um, have these great inflection points and interactions with our users. I think internally, one of the things that we use, and again, I love automation, is that we're looking at ways in which we can leverage automation within Slack, within email, to really give the users a notification where there's an action that they can take when something happens. And I think that that's going to be pivotal to our success of implementing Zero Trust, but also making sure that our users really understand why the risk that they create and that, how they can help us do our jobs better. I love that, Jamika. So all of that capability that you're really kind of enhancing consistently around not taking a trust approach, but consistently validating. So that's wonderful. Jim, you know, it's so interesting hearing everybody talk about um, expectations from the business around value for zero trust. Now, you're, you, you know, we can see uh, the Cloud Security Alliance taking up moves to really um, assemble those that expertise and that collaboration around a, a common way of being able to uh, quantify zero trust. So um, I'm interested when, you know, when you decided to take that approach, what, were, what was the business problem that most people came to you to, to solve, to say, you know, this is why we think, Jim, we need to be highlighting zero trust on the Cloud Security Alliance. I'm interested in your take on, on what, how they articulated either the problem or the value they would get from such, a, from such an effort. Absolutely. And it's it's things that both Jamika and Steve have highlighted in, in what they've said. So, you know, I've been in cybersecurity for 30 years. And, and when you talk about some of the principles of zero trust and it's wanting to accomplish least privilege because we don't we can't trust everything. It, that's something in Orange Book security. It's been around for a long time. But uh, it, it was a matter of the technology evolution and the automation, which, you know, we're cloud security lines. So cloud and the ability to have on-demand orchestration of resources really is reinventing cybersecurity. And that has created this foundation where it's, you know, really possible. 
so the the Steve had mentioned the pandemic too as being this sort of a, a tipping point, and that's absolutely what we heard from organizations that they felt they had very strong security that maybe was aligned with zero trust. But then when they needed to go work from home, they had these very strong systems and all these platforms. And now it was in a house in, in integrated with some smart home um, that they weren't sure about and teenagers looking over this two factor authenticated system. And maybe they were in an architecture that was using sort of fixed capacity VPNs that were sized for maybe 10% of the workforce and not 100%. And maybe they were using virtual desktop interfaces that were also um, assuming a certain capacity and now it was 100% of the workforce. So, so people came to us to say, okay, now we understand that we've been living a little bit in the past. We see the promise of all of the automation capabilities, but we need to understand this better because we're getting inundated with different people saying, hey, our specific technology is zero trust. And really what it means is it can be part of your zero trust journey if you think about this more strategically. So, so what we are seeing is organizations are getting to understand how significant zero trust is that it's probably the model and framework that we're going to actually sort of reinvent, recast most, if not all of the internet and new technology that we bring on board. And so that becomes very important for us to understand, okay, how do we do things right as we are enabling new technologies, as we're bringing them into the market, as we're bringing them into our organization, how do we make sure we do this in a right in the right way? So, so we are minimizing those those the the different threats, the different issues, and can we show that we are getting better ROI about that? So, so we're trying to again elevate this and more of that strategic view, and so that when you talk to C levels, that CFOs understand how this is very important, the board understands how this is very important, but. It's it's great timing right now. Right now, all of the things that have happened in the world, some good, some bad, have put us at a point where we can make great strides with zero trust with the tools that are available. Well, that's brilliant. Excellent. So really what we're saying is that uh, this is the time. This is the, the tipping point. You, you, need to, you need to be leveraging this framework because we are working from anywhere. And uh, we need to alter the way that we're architecting things because um, the way that we architected it really doesn't work as well. And it's kind of accelerated the problem statement. So, so understanding that then, and I think that this panel's done a brilliant job at kind of uh, articulating that value. So the, the, in the US, a discretionary 10.9 billion has been set aside for federal uh, civilian cybersecurity capabilities. That's an 11% increase on the year prior. So here we've got some budget folks. <laughs> we had to go shopping. <laughs> Aside from technology, where do you see the investment should be made? So you're off at the shop with your, your X number of billion dollars and your outcome is a zero trust framework. How might you recommend organizations? Where do they, where do they start? Um, who would like to go first on that one? I think I'll, I'll start. I think, oh, right. I think yeah. that people, right? I think mm -hmm. the investment is in talent. Um, the, the security pipeline, talent pipeline, we all are essentially trading employees. Um, we train them, we, we grow them, and then we ship them off to another CISO that we probably know. Um, and they go into their next phase of their journey. I think it's critically important that we continue to um, build out the security talent pipeline. I think that we have to look outside of some of our traditional norms for those, those people because they're there. I think they don't always come from engineering or technology backgrounds. I think folks with creative backgrounds are, are great um, folks to bring onto our teams. And so I would say if I had my shopping list out, I'd be on the people aisle, uh, making sure that we continue to build out the strategic pipeline for security talent. Oh, I love that. Okay, so we're in the pipeline. And do you make any, any tips or hints to the audience on the kind of thing that we need to be conscious of as we train our talent pipeline, so that they're able to architect for a zero trust, any particular uh, skills that you'd recommend? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I am always looking for practitioners. Um, and, and this is going to be hard to say because I know we do this a lot in this industry, but 
typically someone who's just gone through a cybersecurity boot camp is not yet a practitioner. And so I think we have to we have to add um, to those boot camps. We have to add viable internships, um, training grounds where they can actually get practical um, implementation knowledge. Because I think none of us come out of college or out of our boot camps really ready to be practitioners. And so I would say that there's work that we need to do um, as the leadership of this community to really allow folks to become those practitioners that we're looking for. And we're looking for threat intelligence, threat hunting, cyber defense, um, even on the compliance side, even down to privacy, I think it's closely aligned with what, what we do. And so when we think about um, the skills that we're looking for, we're looking for folks who have the propensity to learn very quickly um, what we do. But also, I think it's, it's bigger than that. We have to give um, the right kind of training so that when they come out of these out of these organizations or boot camps or college, they're really ready to hit the ground running. And so I think that happens through practical access to internships at companies like all of ours. Um, I think we all have something to add from a value add perspective to the talent pool um, that we can really provide. That's wonderful. Okay, so shopping aisle number one has a <laughs> has a bundle load of talent to that shopping cart. So uh, what about you, Jim? What would be in your shopping cart when you hit the front of the line? <laughs> what do you what would you purchase with your yeah. uh, budget? I'd, I'd probably be buying a lot of what Jamika is selling, honestly, <laughs> because I think that uh, education is is fundamental to this. I think it's it's sort of a um, an all of the above all of industry approach that we need to do. I'm seeing a lot of interesting things in terms of let's look at apprenticeships as a really good model for how we improve uh, cybersecurity talent. Um, a lot of on-demand sorts of learning and and thinking about how we align the different CPE efforts with the different credentials that are out there. Um, more technical in, in, uh, um, education, I'm finding a lot of cybersecurity professionals are finding with all of the scripting and automation, they need to pull out some of the, the Python and some of the scripting skills that maybe they, they had before. So I think that's very important. I would say to add to education, I think the collaboration, which we try to do is to have the sharing of best practices that it's, we've, we've got to get past this idea that that the obscurity provides security. And if, if organizations have developed really good zero trust implementations in, in whether it's like for a specific uh, computer system, a specific um, business department, or it's more of that enterprise foundation, we need to be sharing all of those things because we know the bad guys share quite a bit and they're very agile, but we've got to be able to share the case studies and all that information and it helps us build better best practices which again goes into that pipeline of what we can be doing to educate everyone else i love that jim so you're saying really um from an education perspective join local groups join your peers have the discussions on how they're implementing zero trust and what's worked and what's not worked and come forward and, and also share your journey and where you are, which perfectly leads me to you, Steve. <laughs> so when we're thinking about our shopping cart, right? And, and how, I mean, you've done a, a phenomenal job at NT Data with um, zero trust and making it you know, a framework that we all recognize. How do you do that, Steve? How, how did you make sure you had the right talents and skills to be able to design a, you know, the architecture so it supported frame, uh, uh, zero trust? Because last I checked, there's no zero trust certification. <laughs> you know, so how, how did you get the right people? Yeah. Great question. I, to me, this comes down to making sure you have a North Star, right? Some, some idea of where are you ultimately steering the ship? Once you get the right people, it's not going to help you if they have no idea what direction to go in, right? The old saying of, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So I do think spending a little bit of time, and I do mean a little bit of time on strategy and not overthinking this, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You must start moving, but get everybody aligned and moving in one direction. That was kind of the first challenge. Then you can start skilling people towards where do you think they need to be, not now, not yesterday, but really for that journey going forward. And I think Jamika and, and Jim both hit it square on the head. Yeah, this is a big people exercise, of course. Um, I also like where Jim was going in terms of what comes next around information sharing. And I'll, 
I use this term, it's perhaps a little um, controversial, but cyber shaming. We have no problems absolutely crucifying people that had an incident. And I guarantee you, you know, that the age old wisdom of it's not if, it's when you will get attacked. Everybody says those words, but they clearly do not embrace it. And that's a shame because to Jim's point, the bad guys absolutely share and they have no pride of ownership and they are very good at upskilling their trade craft. We are not. The good guys, so to speak, are not. And some of those $10.9 you know, billion, which frankly should be like $100 billion, but I digress, um, at, at the end of the day, really need to go towards some of the regulatory protections that make it safer for companies to truly talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of incidents and do it without fear of reprisal, do it without that kind of cyber shaming view of, I, I was naughty, and so I'm not going to go talk about what just happened, even though that is exactly where you learn the most. We tell our children, if you're a parent, you will learn the most through your mistakes. That is the best learning opportunity you have because you tried, you did something, and maybe you succeeded. That's awesome. But you'll learn more when you fail. And the fact that we're not sharing lessons from those failures, I view as where I would spend a lot of that money. Oh, I love that. So really spending time being able to continuously improve and learning from the mistakes that that we make and allowing them to be signposts along the way, I think is really, that's a really great um, approach. So just kind of thinking a little bit about, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how the importance of cybersecurity and really one of the things I think that it's cybersecurity really is an environmental, social and governance ESG responsibility. It's really a corporate responsibility, I think, because we're being trusted with data and um, it's about the company brand and really increasing, I think, customer and constituents really understanding that you value them and you, you know, you, you're protecting them. Um, so your thoughts about, um, Steve, are you seeing organizations treating cybersecurity as an ESG issue? Is that becoming a more popular stance? I do think it's becoming more popular. I think right now we're still early days. So where we see a lot of the traction is in manufacturing or critical infrastructure where there's been more discussion more news articles, more conversation. I think people are more open to those ideas as ESG or as corporate responsibility in general. Um, you will see that starting to manifest differently, though, as companies realize the asset or the, the brand value that cybersecurity brings to the game. And if you talk about the governance side of this specifically, that's where the boards are really going to start saying, okay, we're spending a lot of money with ESG, rightfully so. How and I do think there's a natural bridge between this topic uh, that classically we've thought of as kind of an environmental issue and a little bit of societal corporate responsibility, but not so much on the G. I think the G has been kind of lowercase. <laughs> and I yeah. think going forward, they will be more of an embracing of that uppercase G as asset value, brand value, kind of the, the market recognition for companies that do this well where that trust is maintained, where they really do as a customer of a business feel like I'm being taken care of, they will continue to succeed. And I think that's what will be the driver for broader and more comprehensive ESG adoption. That's great. And I'm interested in your take, Jim, as well, because, you know, as we, there've been a lot of organizations that have had issues with breaches and as Steve mentions it's difficult coming forward and being honest and I think it is so important that we all are able to learn like I'm endlessly grateful for organizations that allow us to have insight into what happened so that we can fix um, those I issues as well but um, I wonder about your take then on Jim do you see people as seeing cybersecurity as a you know, ESG issue, because we've had breaches where, you know, after the breach, the share value goes up, right? Because the consumer is confused about where the breach happened, or it's like we have breach fatigue, I don't care. But we're not, you know, to some degree, um, 
until we had ransomware attacks, which really brought people to a halt. And they're like, okay, now it's definitely costing me money. You know, there's been, yeah, what's your take on the fact that there's a little bit of confusion around data where the breach actually occurs? Mm -hmm. And should we, you know, especially in the US, I think there are different attitudes towards privacy in Europe and the US. Yeah, your take, Jim, on, on is it becoming an ESG issue? Because, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it is. I think like Steve says, it's it's somewhat early. It's kind of interesting. So from our perspective of being this, this cloud organization, uh, we've seen this transformation of the software industry to be software as a service. And and you know, we've if you get outside of maybe somewhat of the bubble of cybersecurity in that industry, the, the software as a service business solutions that are not cyber based at core, their understanding their business really is selling trust. That's like the core, no matter what they're doing, really they're, they're, that's what they're doing because you, you don't go to their brick and mortar building. You don't get a chance to go sit down with them and, and have coffee with them. And so it's just very important that they're able to show that, that this is what they're doing. Um, the, a, a couple of things on how that relates to just the breaches and, and things that happen and how this is becoming more of like a, a, a community or societal good is that we're seeing more and more as, you know, every type of crime has the cyber element to it and an online element to it that organizations are understanding more and more that what they are seeing could have broader societal impl implications and you know so much you know of, of horrible things like take human trafficking for example things like that exploitation of children have uh, an online element that can make its way in very surprising ways can be even hidden in different systems and so that people are understanding more and more that they've got that greater good responsibility of um, the 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 breach side of things, I think, as he was saying, it's been often that shaming. And I, I think we're starting to see this being more, more viewed like natural disasters almost. It's like hurricanes and things like that. They're going to happen. They're going to hit a, an area and you can be resilient to those things or not. So that's something that I, th I think we're starting to see that. And again, being really good about that and viewing, hey, I've got to disclose this breach, even whether or not the government says I have a disclosure guideline, I can do some good if I'm explaining you know, what happened, the types of payloads, the malicious payloads, all those sorts of things. So, so we're, we're getting there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there's there's always risks when you're talking about bad things that happen, and so there's still a, a, a lot of that there. But I, I see that I see that tide change happening. That's great, and and certainly I saw a call out. If there are people watching the panel and you want to ask questions, do feel free to drop that question um, in your chat. And thanks so much for that, Jim. That's really interesting around um you know whether or not it's becoming a shame issue whether people are stepping forward jamika i wanted to ask you um a question that comes up quite a lot for us is when you're when you're so you've decided right you've listened to the panel you're like totally i'm into zero trust i know we have to put a zero trust framework together and we talked a little bit about where you start and training your people and making sure that they have an understanding uh, of of security automation, all the components within there, um, but from a pillar approach, how do I how do I where do I start? Right. So Steve did mention you need a strategy for us, which really makes sense to me. So first of all, we need that strategy, and but do I take this as a pillar by pillar approach? So let's say, hey, I'm going to get the most out of you know modernizing network, and so I'm going to start with that, and then move on to one of the other pillars, and then maybe I you know, I increase the maturity of each of those pillars, or do I go, no, I need to do all of them, um, you know, and, and yeah, so how do I approach this problem? How do I zero trustify my environment? So I think you approach it the way CIS most CISOs approach it, and that's you look at the risks to your organization. Um, and I think you approach, you, you, you can use a risk-based approach to implementing zero trust as well. And so you should really be thinking about 
what's important, what are you trying to protect, and where is the risk associated with that? Um, I would naturally want to say that identity is the front door of zero trust, but I think that it's it's more than that, right? Because we we have identity space that's ever evolving at this point. And so you've got workforce identity that sometimes looks a lot like um, SIAM, looks like customer identity and access management. And then on top of that, you've got privileged access management. You've got um, you know a ton of different things there. And so I think that ultimately, where you take your next step on the journey should be based on how risk averse are you? How much are you, what of that burden are you willing to bear? And then taking a look at your organization and saying, you know what, I'm still a using two factor, which I don't even know why we even call it that, but it should be just banished. But I, you know, if, if that's what, if that's the greatest risk, then multi-factor is your next step or single sign-on adding that is your next step. But I think it's based on the risk that you have to your organization and what's important to you. And so Again, I would love to say that it's identity, but I think that that's not true in every case because there are lots of businesses that do identity really, really well. Um, and they have partners and programs in place to do that well. I think it's really based on, on where your risk sits in your organization and how quickly you wanna resolve that. That's the pillar of zero trust that I think you need to dive into first. Oh, I love that. Okay, so do a risk assessment, understand what you have, your business, and then understand what risks you want to decrease. To mitigate, um, yeah mitigate. So um, Jim, any thoughts on that pillar by pillar overall approach? How should you risk based approach? What would be the best approach to take? Well, I'm, I'm talking to enterprises a lot about this right now. And it's interesting, I'm actually seeing both approaches. And I'm also seeing both approach, approaches even within an organization. So I'm getting a lot of enterprises, and here's an example, one that they've got a just a very specific application and very sensitive data, very confidential data that they're concerned about right now. And so it's somewhat tactical. And so they're taking a zero trust approach on this one system that's only got about 30 users and it's got a combination of you know, data, structured data, unstructured data. And so they're taking an approach of how, how do we take zero trust to really identify, to threat model this, to understand where those issues are and, and deal with that. And then, then you have organizations, and again, even within the same organization, they'll look at, we, we know that we're going to have a journey to zero trust. And so we are going to look, uh, and Jamika being somewhat humble there, they're going to go look at how do we make sure we have a really good understanding of the identities, not just of our people, but all of our technology assets, all of our software, all of our even virtual machines. How do we have a really strong uh, um, and very um, detailed identity management capability so that we know that these future zero trust issues that we're going to maybe take a business unit or application by application, they're going to be able to do that in the most seamless way. So, so we're, we're seeing that sort of strategic infrastructure enablement as well as, hey, we've got to handle these problems that we're doing right now. And they're just saying, hey, zero trust is maybe a better way for me to be thinking about a, a method to handle a tactical problem um, versus some of the other ways I've thought about it. Oh, I love that. So you could be doing a risk assessment in a a one particular around a one particular valuable asset or across the organization. And essentially you're solving the problem of how you implement the security control by infusing zero trust tenants within it. And and that then may actually have a larger risk reduction than if you just went for a security control with without those tenants and views. That really, really makes sense to me. So, Steve, I mean, you have huge amounts of experience in, in rolling out Zero Trust. And actually, we also had a question from our audience as you answered that question about what approach would you take? Where would you start? Um, and also how it uh, we have a particular question from our audience about how it affects the end user experience, which I know is a question that's close to your heart. So yeah, over to you, Steve. Absolutely. So big believer in putting user experience at the heart of all of this, right? Started that conversation this way. It's what I beat into, you know, every conversation I have on Zero Trust, I cannot hit that drum hard enough. Because if your users do not want to go on that journey, 
adults are awesome at being obstinate. Let, let's just be honest. We, we, we are stuck in our ways and we would like to stay in this particular way. So if you don't focus on that aspect, productivity suffers, your security risk suffers, the operational value suffers. It, it is not going to be a good investment. So my, my answer is look at that first. You, you also kind of opened the entire dialogue here, Sushila, with the idea that how, how zero trust came to be wasn't a yesterday conversation. It's, it's been out there for a very long time, which means that people have been making investments they might not have thought it was zero trust related, but really it is. So I think taking stock of where did I make my substantive investments over the last, let's say, five years, and maybe those are good enough. And look at the other areas of my proverbial garden that I'd like to water at this point, and that's how I would choose to go. So as opposed to maybe spending time on a proper risk analysis, just a financial analysis may be adequate to say, I have spent 50% of my budget, whatever that budget size is doing X and Y. I know I've intentionally not had the money to go after Z. So today's the day for Z, right? I will now focus on that aspect. And I will make sure that when I do that, those investment dollars are done in kind of a zero trust frame. One of those very successful methods is what Jim was talking about. You could test your strategy. If you're unsure what, what you need to do for zero trust, find something that matters try to protect that one thing in a zero trust way, which will also help your workers, your staff, right? The security and IT and, and frankly, everybody get their head around what does this mean? Because it is going to be a cultural change. You are going to have to tell people, here's what the new way of, of being productive looks like. And, and hopefully that's less friction. Hopefully you get to the point where you understand, ah, here are the technology partners I can rely on. Here are some process partners who've gone down this path and I can kind of beg, borrow and steal my way towards a faster acceleration in this regard. And then, then I can really focus on the people aspect. So that, that's how I would really look at this. That's really helpful. And I thought it was really interesting. We also got another question, which I actually see a whole lot um, and interested in your guys take is around, okay, so, um, I have an existing framework, right? I'm using this CSF, I'm using whatever it is, right? And then they go, but how does zero trust fit in? How do I have multiple frameworks? And so um, could you perhaps describe how to, because to my mind, you know, that it's the design of the controls using some of the tenets of zero trust, which enables us to take a zero trust approach. But it's a great question on, so I've, I, I'm a NIST CSF shop. How do I, how does zero trust fit into that framework? Who don't like to reply to that one? I want to jump in just real yes. quick on that one. And I'll be brief in my answer here. I think all of the frameworks right now leave a lot to be desired for zero trust alignment. And I think if you tried to, in air quotes, back in whoever, right? I, want, I, I don't care the framework. Tried to back that into where zero trust is, you're going to be in for a world of pain and suffering that that's not really worth it. Now, I'm not saying don't try to map some simple principles over. What I am saying is don't expect that it will be a clean one-to-one -one type of relationship right now. We are just not ready as an industry to talk or think in that regard. Even the latest thing like CMMC from the governmental perspective is not zero trust enabled. If you look at the delta between CMMC and M2209, which is really the manifestation, if you will, of President Biden's edict of must move to zero trust architecture, and then OMB published that article, those two things are not related. So we have a ways to go. I would say don't stress the framework mapping. Just do what you know and talk to your peers about is right and keep moving and wait for, the, wait for those standards to catch up. Wow, that's super helpful, Steve. Thank you. Any comment, Jamika, Jim, on on frameworks and how to zero, how to live in a zero trust world? Well, I would say to... Steve answered the question perfectly. That's exactly yeah. what I would have said as well. It's a, it's it's a conceptual or real um, implementation when we think about frameworks, and so it's never one to one. Don't spend too many cycles trying to map it if you have a framework or implementation that actually works for you. 
So if, if I could answer it, um, which I think aligns with um, what Stephen G. Meeker is saying, but in a, somewhat of a different way, I think it, the, the more you understand zero trust as a strategy and this idea that you can't implicitly trust everything, that you need to continually verify things, the strong identity strategy for this, that you can put a lot of what you've invested in the proper context and continue to be using it. Because I do get a lot of people who are afraid that they're gonna to have to throw out a lot of things. And it's simply not the case, but if you don't understand it as a philosophy, as a set of guiding principles, you might be led down a path to reinvent things. And then I, I do agree that we're gonna mature and grow. And I know like the cybersecurity framework, I think it's actually right now going under a revision. Those, those things will get better. And it's, it's not just zero trust, but just understanding more of the on-demand orchestrated model compute as a utility that that cloud is as well that's going to improve a lot of a lot of the best practices we have i have so enjoyed this conversation and i wanted to give everybody just one minute each to to wrap up on you know you had to give folks a piece of advice as they wherever they find themselves in the zero trust journey you know, what would be the the top advice you'd give them around um, how they could be successful or what to watch for? You know, just choose it out of the bag. What would be your summary? And then the, the question as well that I have two more that I'd like to kind of bolt in there is how do you know that you're successful? So you've gone, OK, here's the advice on how to implement it. How do you know that you go, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm on a B plus on my journey. So how do I measure that maturity? Um, and then also, when you have people that you're leaving along the way, people are going, but what about the network team? And that's you know, a great question. <laughs> what about the, you know, the folks that, that are struggling to with the fact that well, you know, everything was okay before and I don't really have to change and I don't want to change my security cloud or, or anything else. So just just one line from each of you or a couple of lines from each of you around uh, what advice could you give and especially with a view on uh, how do they know they are successful or not successful and also how do you bring along people that are laggards and are not keen on changing. So. Uh, where do you want to start? Maybe I'll go through the panel as they're listed on my screen. Jim, do you want to start first, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's a whopper. But um, I, <laughs> I'd say that you know, shortly, it's it's again, you got to think strategy and you got to think about the future. And is the way I'm considering this very adaptable for the unknown? There's so many unknowns, and so. If you're thinking in that way, you you should be able to find that this is something that everybody in the organization plays a role in. It is that people process technology we talked about. And then within that, there ends up being a lot of metrics you already have that you should be able to measure this with. Wonderful. Thanks, Jim. Steve, over to you. Any any words of advice, Sunny? <laughs> so, so I think that for me, the first and the third are answered the same way, which is focus on the user, which I think that horse quite a bit. So I, I'll stop now and say on the second one, in terms of how do you measure success? Um, I, again, I wouldn't be too fancy here. Um, my view would be get an ideology that you can stick behind that gives you some sense of, again, directionality. In our world, we call them North Stars. They're kind of three-year views of where you're headed. And then tie that towards how you're going to prioritize certain things. So the, the mantra, if you will, that we've used quite successfully is see it, manage it, secure it. I have to see something before I can manage it, and I have to manage it before I can secure it. So if you that, that can guide many, many things from what I invest in to where am I at in my kind of journey of cleanup to what comes next and how do I inform my people from a culture perspective. So I would say that's where my head would go. I love that. And we've got several blogs actually on our site on that idea of see it, manage it, and secure it. So definitely uh, catch up on that. Thanks so much, Steve. And Jamika, any summary well, for our audience? 
Sure. So I think on the question on how do we convince people, I think it's not convincing. I love the concept of distributed decision making. I think it's an idea that we're all invested in insecurity and that we all should. And it's a people centric concept. Um, and so I think when we think about the teams outside of us um, that we're trying to convince, like our CIO teams, um, we have to distribute our decision making process to really show that this investment will benefit all of the organizations or the entire enterprise long, long term. I think how do you actually understand if you've done zero trust right. I think coming out of a breach um, is a great way to know if you've done it you do really well because you get a lot of lessons learned from that. Now, I'm not saying that you should do it that way, but I'm, that's one of the ways to really yeah. measure yourself. I still believe in, in red teaming and blue teaming yeah. and really pen testing yourself. Um, and so I think that those are all still great concepts to really understand where you sit on the zero trust journey is to really get some of that external insight and input in. And so I would say that the those are, those are my, my, my thoughts. Still a very people-centric approach to all of it. Um, I think the more that we can reduce friction across this space, the better we will inc uh, we'll increase adoption and implementation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I really had the best panel in the world, and I'm so sorry to let you guys go, but I really do. I need to pause for a moment and recognize an organization that's been making great strides for clean water and sustainability. As we say goodbye to our wonderful panel, the Water Creeper um, Alliance organization is the largest, fastest growing nonprofit that's solely focused on clean water, which is, a, you know, an area that we so believe in. There are more than 300 groups made up of 1.1 million volunteers and supporters that span over 45 countries with initiatives focused on preserving and protecting 2.6 million square miles, about twice the area of India of waterway. I'm so pleased to have Mark Yagi from Waterkeeper Alliance organization with us today and announce that NTT Data and our wonderful Nest Employee Resource Group, which was created to build awareness of environmental footprint and sustainable behavior, have decided to give $5,000 to Waterkeeper Alliance organization in celebration of Earth Day. And so Fernanda Gallardo and Madhavi Singala are also with us today among the amazing leaders of our NEST group and they're so proud that Entity Data can do this on their behalf. Well, thank you so much, Sushila. And I wanna thank Fernanda and Madhavi and everyone involved on behalf of Waterkeeper Alliance. We're so very grateful for uh, NTT Data's generous support, which helps us protect our right to clean water in communities around the world. And I just want to say it was really inspiring to speak with such an engaged audience on Tuesday about water pollution and climate change and how our actions today can positively impact tomorrow. And want to wish you all a happy Earth Day. I love how you say uh, we are the world we live in, and I'm excited to work together to make our world the best it can be for this generation and, and for those to come. And so thank you again. And I look forward to exploring more opportunities to work together to tackle the issues of climate change and water. I love the Green Me initiative and all the work that the team is doing. So Donica, now let me turn this back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sushila. It's going to be hard to match your energy, but I am going to try. So Dan, I know we are visiting the Santa Monica Pier today. How about you show us around and then take us through some of the highlights of Route 66. And if you have any Earth Day or sustainability things, we'd like to hear those quickly too. Sounds good. I Sounds good. Can I just <laughs> jump in and make a quick announcement before Dan goes? Sure. Thank you so much. No, I just wanted to grab the opportunity to make a quick announcement that we are from the NEST ERG actually rolling out a Green Army Challenge that is expected to kick start in June or July timeframe. The whole idea is that, you know, we reduce the carbon footprint at an individual employee level by embracing, you know, various environment-friendly practices to fight the climate change. So this challenge will run for four to six weeks timeframe uh, with the highest carbon footprint savers emerging as winners. So in our view, this is a very powerful way of spreading awareness among our employees and empower them to fight climate change at home, work, and beyond. So once again, happy Earth Day, because the theme this year is invest in your planet. So let's invest time and effort to go greener, make our Earth a beautiful place to live. Thank you so much, Adonika and Dan Rais. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Dan, over to you. All righty. Well, I'll, I can 
I can uh, tell you that today we are back on California's Route 66, and today we're moving from the high desert to San Bernardino, California. And we'll be traveling just a little further west where we come to the Pasadena Bridge, which is just on the other side of the Rose Bowl. And you could see it dead center uh, in the center of your screen if it wasn't hidden behind those trees, but right in front of you is the interstate that was built in the exact same style as the Pasadena Bridge. Now this was a spur of Route 66 for just a few years in Los Angeles, but it's created a cool hiking opportunity to hike right under Route 66. And uh, this will actually take you just to the left there, you can see 66, it'll take you right into downtown Los Angeles. Now downtown LA is actually the original endpoint of Route 66, ending on the corner of 7th and Broadway. And uh, there it is. Uh, it, that was the original endpoint of Route 66 until it was extended out to Santa Monica in 1936. Now that's my sign. I put it up on the Santa Monica here to recognize the traditional uh, endpoint. And it was a more fitting end for people coming out west to see if they could make their dreams come true. Now for anyone on the actual journey of 66, it goes along Santa Monica Boulevard becoming, I guess, before it comes to a spiritual end at Ocean Avenue. And then that's before it comes down to the traditional endpoint at the pier where my shop is. And then that's my shop right there. I put the shop there because I wanted a place where people could, could celebrate the end of their Route 66 journey. And that's me. Uh, okay, I don't know where you found that picture, but good, good job. Uh, the pier sees uh, six and a half million people uh, every year. So I knew if I put my shop there and I put up a sign that marked the end of Route 66, we'd be able to keep the road alive forever. And uh, it does get a lot of attention now. So anyway, I just want to thank you everyone for joining me on this trip along Route 66. I hope you enjoyed the Santa Monica Pier and my shop and everything else you've seen along the way. And it has been an absolute pleasure taking this trip with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. And I mean, wow, our time today really has flown by. Um, I have had a blast during this entire journey through digital transformation. And I hope that you all did too. And on behalf of the NTT Data team, we would like to thank you for joining us on this amazing journey along Route 66. If you have not been able to join all the stops, we have dropped the link into the chat. You can also go directly to the NTT Data Services website and find all prior on-demand events on the NTT Data Events section. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon and happy Earth Day.